to a different angle on this. The, the state, I wanted to talk about state housing laws and we all know what they're intended to do. But, you know, the reality is that even though they develop, allow developers a lot more flexibility than they ever had before, I mean, the reality is they haven't been as effective as the state has intended. And, you know, the short answer is because, you know, when you talk about infield housing, which is supposed to drive California housing growth, you know, those costs are dominated nowadays by construction, not by zoning. And Sacramento is basically unwilling to take on anything except construction traffic. So that's the short answer. But, you know, if if you look at all this, just the Sacramento argument has been fundamentally that <clears throat> communities, you know, have intentionally used tight zoning and approvals in order to suppress new construction. And so therefore the state needs to take over. And the central idea is this, okay? It's first, if developers can make more money building housing, then they'll build more. And second, you know, the state can make that happen by getting rid of most zoning, and that'll increase developer profits on housing, and therefore uh, developers will build more. By that, we're talking. Hello. Everybody's still there. Yeah. Keep okay. going. I I think um yeah keep going. Um okay. again um everybody please mute. Okay, and then by, by zoning, basically what we're talking about is limits on building size, location, design standards, that kind of stuff, right? And then third, if that happens, then they'll build so much new housing, the prices will fall and, and more people can afford to live in California. And um, what I'm gonna, I mean, this is basically the business plan before, behind the whole effort. And what I'm gonna suggest is that this target of using zoning uh, to make system, housing systematically more effective for private developers, you know, it just may not have enough impact uh, on on developer costs and profits for the for the whole mechanism to work. So, to begin with first, if the state has local planning. Then uh, you know obviously communities are going to have to give it up, and it's not just you know sort of you know crappy projects or not. But there's also a very large administrative effort to to cope and comply and adopt all these new state requirements. And, and in fact, I'll, I'll come back to this later. I mean, I, it looks like the cost statewide is is into the billions of dollars, right? And so, if, you know, communities have not unreasonably asked, okay, in exchange for all that, you know, what, what do we get in return? And the and the consistent answer and the stated justification for every single one of these bills by every single state official, from Gavin Newsom all the way to our local assemblyman, right, has been. Housing affordability, it's too expensive to live in California uh, and we're gonna do these bills and you're gonna lose control, but in exchange, Californians will get housing affordability. Now, some people think this is a, a good bargain. Other people think it's a bad bargain. That's the nature of public policy, but irrespective of whether you agree it's a good idea or not, you know, the state promised affordability and they ought to be held accountable to that commitment. Now, we all know that most of these bills actually don't say anything in them about prices or costs, including SB9 here, right? Uh, but, you know, the pledge to voters for all these bills, and I think our local assemblyman, Mark Berman, articulated it well here, you know, none of these bills is gonna individually solve the problem, but other clearly produce housing affordability for Californians. And the state laws are drafted to preempt local zoning, you know, in order to implement the concept on the previous slide. And then the test is gonna be, or at least one test is, does it produce enough results in order to justify, you know, this trade-off for, for the majority of Californians? And so <clears throat> what I want to do is uh, uh, first look at the results so far, and then some of the economics behind them, and then touch on state legislature policy formulation and a little bit what the costs to Californians have been with this. So first of all, you know, what's happened? And the short answer is not much, okay? The data show essentially no impact, okay, on affordability, homelessness, or new, or even new housing production. We're talking market rate, not, not uh, below market here. Uh, since the big legislative push started around seven years ago. So if you look at this chart, the green line is median rents in California, the blue line is homelessness, and the black line is number of housing starts. And what we see is from the before the 150 housing bills to today, okay, rent in California, median rent in California grew 38% from about $1,200 a month uh, 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 over the last seven years. So it didn't fall, it grew. And the axis for that is the green one over here. Homeless, uh, 
in, in California, the blue line, it's the number of unhoused individuals in California is about 130,000 in 2017, and it's risen 31% since then. And the black line is the number of California housing units starts by year. And it uses the same axis on the left as the homeless count because the numbers are similar. And what we see is that housing production over the last seven years has basically stayed flat, a little over 100,000 units per year, okay? The same as it was, it's the same after the state laws as it was before the state laws. So you sort of look at that and well, what, what difference did it make, right? I mean, right? Despite all the legislation, neither state housing costs nor homelessness fell, but instead both rose while housing production basically didn't change. Now there was one significant uptick, which was ADUs, and there has been a real increase in those. But unfortunately, ADUs turn out to be such a small fraction of the state goals that the increase just doesn't help very much. And so the data basically show no, cor no correlation from the state housing laws, all this work, okay, to housing work, affordability, or production. And this has not gone unnoticed, okay? In fact, there was a flurry of press uh, last year uh, over this sort of, uh, even the Turner Center, which has been one of the strongest uh, proponents uh, of this plan, you use the word stagnant. And so, yes, people find individual projects say, wait, but this bill, you know, enabled this, this and that project in my town and so forth. And that's true, but the reality is we were already producing 100,000 thousand units here and there were four. Right? The point of this action was to galvanize the aggregate. You know, and that essentially didn't happen. Which sort of begs the question, right? If you have the same amount of cost, the same amount of housing, the same cost of housing with the new laws as without them, you know, what good are the new laws? Right? Now, one response, of course, is that, well, it, it's too soon. We need more study. We need more laws. We need higher targets. You know, cities are still obstructing us and so forth and so forth and so forth. You know, perhaps. But, you know, it's worth looking at the actual economics of creating housing. And so, sorry, this is where it sort of gets a little bit wonky. Please bear with me because it's, it's a, I think it's a key part of the puzzle. The state plan is based almost entirely, okay, on eliminating zoning restrictions, okay? And what I'm gonna suggest is that for high density infill housing, which is meant to be the main future of California, looser zoning may have almost no impact on market housing prices. And if that's correct, then there's no laws the way these state laws can ever deliver affordability or even very much production, no matter what the targets are or how many bills get passed, because they all rely on zoning. So I'm going to try to show three things here. First, there are lots of costs to building housing, but the only one that's really affected by zoning is actually land cost. And second, and maybe the biggest leap, okay, is that in urban high density projects, the land cost is only a small part of total costs, okay? Now that sounds counterintuitive because we all know land's expensive, but if it's correct, then it would imply state zoning laws can't much affect project costs either. And then third, if prevailing market rate rents ever fell more than project costs fell, uh, then developers stopped developing. Okay, so let's dive in. Okay, sorry about the eye chart here, but what this shows is the cost cost structure of building new high density market rate housing in urban coastal California, in this case, central San Jose. And, you know, I'm gonna walk through this a little bit, but I wanna be, it's important to be clear that this doesn't reflect other kinds of housing, okay? Like single family homes or townhomes. And those have different cost structures, but they aren't nearly as big a piece of the state's housing plans. The state's housing growth is supposed to be driven primarily by unit apartment buildings and condos, in places like the Bay Area, Los Angeles, San Diego, near transit. And that's that's what this data represents, okay? So this analysis is from the city of San Jose last year, but it's consistent with other studies by the Terman Center, Terman Center among other places, all in to build a 900 square foot market rate unit in a seven story apartment building in downtown San Jose near transit costs about $945,000 a unit. So the state legislature's idea is to drive that cost down so developers can make more money building that apartment, so they'll build more of them. So where in the $945,000 can we find some savings? Well, about 80% is actually construction materials and engineering costs, okay? Financing and community impact fees add another 10 or 15%, and that leaves land cost at around 7% of the total. The biggest impact nowadays is actually construction costs, not land costs. Now that's not intuitive. 
Okay, why should the land cost be so small? And it's because unlike a single family home, in a big multi-unit building like this, the price of the underlying land parcel gets shared across many units. So on a per unit basis, it's quite a bit smaller. And it's also because the other costs are just plain high now, especially in the Bay Area. So net land cost really is normally somewhere between five and 10% of the cost of building the apartment. And furthermore, that percentage doesn't change very much whether the apartment is downtown, in an industrial zone, in a single family neighborhood, or next to Steph Curry's house in Atherton. The major costs in a project like this are mostly construction materials and engineering. And those are similar across the core Bay Area. Okay. So I hope that makes sense because it's got some big implications. Okay. But the second piece is when you look at all these costs to build the apartment, in fact, the only one that's affected by zoning is in fact that 7% land cost. And you can see why. So the state laws, including ARENA, okay, and the, and the trigger bills and SB, XXXXX, and so forth, they all let developers put a bigger, denser building with more housing units on the same land parcel. And if we put twice as many apartments on that land parcel, then the land cost per apartment drops in half. Okay, that's the point. Okay. But the construction and the other costs don't change very much with density. Right? The cost of plumbing a bathroom is the same whether there are 10 units in the building or 100. So per unit, upzoning doesn't affect those costs. So you can see where this is going. At least 93% of the costs of building a high density housing unit aren't affected by the state laws. And that has a heavy implication because it suggests that the entire Sacramento housing doctrine, the 150 bills, RENA targets, builder's remedy, all of it may simply not work. You double the building size, say 3% on costs. And 3% rent relief is not what we're shooting for. Inflation will eat that up in a year. However, we're not completely finished yet. Developer economics are different, okay? 3% rent savings might not help a lot of tenants, but maybe a 3% margin increase is a big deal to developers who borrow most of their project costs. And in fact, it is. And that 3% is why they donate to elected officials and nonprofits. So then might a 3% difference in cost or a few percent difference in cost be enough to develop, motivate developers to do more projects? And the answer is yes, okay? The question is, will it produce enough projects to lower market apartment prices more than the 3%? Okay. And here, unfortunately, the economics work in reverse. If housing investment returns really are that sensitive to a couple percent drop in costs, then they're going to be equally sensitive to a couple percent drop in rent. So the minute prevailing market rents started falling or even didn't keep up with inflation and construction, the other costs, development has to stop. So it's catch 22. You can't get a rent savings greater than the cost savings because investors won't lose money. And you can't get much cost savings for this kind of housing out of zoning. Now, if you could cut the construction costs instead, okay, this orange area, big orange bar in the middle, okay. You could get a much larger impact, but the state laws focus on zoning and there's just not enough impact there. So the business plan looks okay on a napkin, but it doesn't survive the actual numbers. So I wanna be really clear here. None of this is to suggest that developers don't have small zone costs, They're a lot, okay? The point is that those changes are very difficult to map either to lower market prices for tenants, either renting or buying, or to more than marginal changes in total production, okay? So all this is a, a little mind bending. You know, you, you start thinking about the entire housing problem differently, but it's really just arithmetic. You put it all together and we have an explanation why, for the previous slide, why 150 state housing laws haven't moved the needle on housing. Because to move that needle and deliver on their pledge of affordability to Californians, the legislature and HCD have to find a way to get new market rate housing built for significantly less than the $945,000 a unit. And they haven't found a way like that, okay? The summary here is the obstacle to affordability isn't local zoning control, it's basic economics. It all comes back to this cost structure, okay? To change this cost structure in any meaningful way is extremely challenging. So, do we understand that? Okay. 
So if we're stuck with these economics, let's say we actually don't really care about affordability, okay? You know, we constantly say we care about affordability here in Sacramento or there in Sacramento, but let's say, but let's say, but let's, let's say we really don't, okay? What else impacts housing production? Well, demand, okay? So if we can't change supply economics, then we need to look at the number of people who can actually afford a $945,000 condo who don't already have one, right? okay? Because everything, and we're looking at condo, again, everything else is more expensive. So if you're talking about single family homes, you're talking about townhomes and so forth, they cost more than 945,000. So they're not gonna move the needle on volume and affordability the way that high density is well. So how many people actually have that? And so I thought the comment at the top of this slide uh, summed it up really well. And this is from the CEO of the California Building Trades Association a couple of years ago. No stranger to Sacramento politics, by the way. And he said, basically, you shouldn't expect a lot of new housing from us until there's more rich people who want to live in it. And I think that pretty much laid it out straight. If we want to build a housing unit, then somebody's got to come up with $945,000 in developers markets. So for a century, California population grew more or less continuously, and we had a steady supply of new people every year who needed somebody to build housing for them. And at the same time, rising inequality in California, especially in the coastal areas, meant that for a while at least, the number of high-income people was actually growing faster than the state population, even as the percentage of middle-income workers was simultaneously shrinking. But we don't have population growth now. And if the State Department of Finance is right, we may not have it again. And so what we have now, at least in the Bay Area, is a sizable group of people who can afford a million dollar condo, another group far away from ever affording one, and a smaller and proportionately shrinking number of people in between. And even if the state could do what Mr. Dunmoyer here implies and bring a lot of new high skill, high wage people into the state, which is essentially how the tech sector grew, that doesn't really do much for the housing burden population, which the entire program is nominally supposed to help. I think this is an important point, although we're sort of getting away from HCD for the moment, right? If you can't change the cost structure, you actually can still increase housing production if there are new high income people to occupy it. And if new people are in fact current lower medium income people who already live here, but get a big raise, which means reduced inequality, okay? Then it's a win. But if those new high income people are new residents moving here from elsewhere, okay? To take advantage of tech jobs, then it doesn't help affordability and might even make it worse because if each new high wage job creates demand for two or three lower wage ones, but only the new high wage people are getting any housing built for them because of this observation. But we really get this through, okay? There's another vexing issue as well, and this is a little more of a hand wave, but imagine you had the opposite of this chart on the right. Imagine our society had a few rich people, a few poor people, and a huge middle class in between closer to what we had in the 1950s, for example. Under that scenario, you can imagine that if small changes where there was a big bubble of people in housing costs might, might help a lot of people, right? But if you have this highly unequal society with a big group of high wage earners at the top, a big group of low wage earners at the bottom, and very few in between, then you need really big changes in housing costs if you're gonna affect more than a few people. So this is a lot to chew on. But if it's accurate, it means that California's housing changes, challenges are probably a lot more deeply rooted and much harder to fix through policy, including zoning policy, than most people think, okay? And all just as a mill. A footnote, it implies that HC really doesn't understand housing in California. So just as sort of the one slide recap, and this is for, for handouts, right? I'm not gonna read it, right? The state focuses entirely on zoning, which doesn't very much impact relevant housing costs. So state policies like ringing in the 150 bills don't make much difference in housing production and costs, either market rate or affordable. And as we've seen, changing the housing economics that country is very hard. However, addressing high inequality and maybe even generational inequality in our society is even harder compared to either of those things. You know, passing zoning bills is pretty darn easy.
which brings us to the question of, and I'm not going to read this one, it brings us to the question of, why would so many intelligent state legislators, all with college degrees and many with law degrees too, commit so much time, effort, and public treasure to so little of the problem with so real, so with no realistic chance of actually solving it that way? You know, the whole answer is, uh, you know, Kevin Kiley, who was uh, an assemblyman uh, uh, a couple of years ago, he's now in the Congress, you know, he gave a fantastic answer. And, uh, and you can just read it. And it basically says it's all politics and posturing and, you know, reluctance to take on special interests. You know, that's basically the politics of zoning bills. And it's a great quote. Right? So one characteristic of zoning bills, other than you can get attention for them and special interests like them, is they don't impact the state budget, which means you don't have to go fight over the state budget for them because you're not committing any money. But just because they don't affect the state budget doesn't mean they don't cost anything. And in fact, they cost a lot. Okay. But all that's paid for out of city and county budgets, which most of our state legislatures don't spend a lot of time worrying about. Okay. So how much has it cost? Okay. And so, you know, this is, there, there's not been a lot of quantitative scrutiny on this that I've seen. So this is a bit of a hand wave, but all of us on this call, you know, have seen our cities forced to spend, you know, piles and piles of, administra of administrative time and effort over it. So Here's, here's an attempt to, to capture that, right? In our city's case, you know, Reno was a big piece, you know, with a lot of detailed planning, huge amount of community outreach and engagement, a lot of analysis, and then multiple rounds of negotiation with HCD, who kept changing what they wanted from round to round, including some really sort of head scratch stuff that wasn't really connected to actually building housing. And of course, all this took lots and lots of consultants too. So it was clearly multiple man years of work or FTE years of work. Okay. Second piece, objective standards. We don't, we spent a lot of time on objective standards. You know, we had to do that. And like everybody else, you know, we had to, we had to come up with and implement it, right? From basically from scratch. And so that was a significant effort. And then seven years of all kinds of different housing laws, density bonus laws, sometimes really detailed stuff like what's the interaction state law, local set laws for which kind of housing and so forth. All this stuff has to get into our municipal codes and, and systems properly, which is a lot of administrative work just to make sure it's all correct, you know, consistent, doesn't trample over anybody's rights. And then we have to deal with developers who come in with some incorrect interpretation of the of the new state law that conflicts with our local laws, you know, and we have to go argue with that. And you can say, yeah, all this stuff is bureaucracy, but, you know, bureaucracy is how government works. OK, so you add it all up over the last seven years including arena and including the objective standards and including deal with 150 laws, you know, and you're into the millions of dollars. Okay. Now our city is 0.17% of the state population. So multiply that out to 500 cities and 40 million people, and you get numbers in the low billions of dollars for the whole state. And in fact, HCD alone has committed at least $1 billion in grants to cities, essentially to help defray the costs of arena consultants. OK, and that's just the tab for cities and counties. Of course, Sacramento themselves spent a lot of time and effort on this. They had a staff of HCD, of course, and negotiating and sometimes even suing cities over it. Big engagements with quote and unquote stakeholders. And let's not forget uh, uh, Governor Newsom's uh, monitoring and compliance teams. Right. So what's the net price tag? You know, it's hard to be certain example exactly, but we're a big state and it's clearly 10 figures. So. You know, I get between three and four billion. You know, maybe it's two, maybe it's five, okay? But it's not a hundred million, okay? Um, so with that, let's briefly go back to the core commitment for a second that in exchange for local control, plus a few billion dollars apparently, uh, Californians would get housing affordability. It should be pretty clear that although the state legislature is still moving forward on the control and money side, there really is no plan in any conventional sense to deliver on the affordability side, as at least one assemblyman from Roseville observed over two years ago. So it's worth asking, were there any winners out of this at all? And there were a few. Developers made slightly more money on basically the same volume of housing they would have built anyway because that's the nature of you know, one more here, one more here, there, one less there. That's kind of the nature of flat, okay? And sometimes uh, under, shall we say, more flexible uh, 
uh, design standards and projects in it. State elected officials uh, talked a lot about uh, their commitment to housing, especially to have bills. You know, and the whole effort's been a huge boon for consultants, uh, including HCD's billion dollars. Right? So, so much of this issue has been framed as pro-housing against anti-housing. And I think that's not a productive analogy. Most people agree that housing costs in California are a big problem. And even for those concerned explicitly, it looks pretty much the table now. Instead, I think a better analogy is these mice, you know, that want to hang a bell on the cat so that they can hear it coming. And they all agree, you know, that's the answer, hang a bell on the cat. But the problem is they have no way to actually get the bell onto the cat. Yeah. The legislature can all agree they're going to create more housing or make cities create more housing. But like the bell on the cat, the reality is they have no way to make that happen because they can't change. They have no, they're not found a way to change the cost here. So what we're left with here is a very expensive government program with no useful results that isn't going anywhere. Okay. Okay. Never mind how they calculated their numbers. <laughs> it's, it's not going anywhere. The criticism has been that cities have not built housing. But Sacramento has both not built housing and also blown a few, billion, a few billion dollars in public money not building housing. And in that, they failed everybody. Because if you wanted local control and at least some checks and balances on bad projects in your community, you know, that's nearly gone. If you wanted a housing relief and affordability, not only have you not got that either, but the whole state control focus has distracted everybody from other things that might actually help, making it worse, not better. So what should happen next? Well, they promised housing affordability to Californians, so they ought to deliver it. And crucially, they need to show that they actually can deliver it. Promises aren't enough anymore. But if they can't deliver affordability, then a responsible management team would now pivot. First, stop wasting money and time on RENA and centralized zoning. Scale RENA back to just a forecasting function again. Fix its math and give zoning back to the cities. And second, spend that money on something where it can actually make a difference. You know, my personal favorite is early childhood education. You know, how will future generations get anything done if our kids can't read? But they might also spend it on Prop 1, for example, instead of going back and diverting money from counties. If Prop 1 can work, it'll be a better investment than RENA has been. Okay. Now, Sacramento want, won't want to do this easily. And this is where I think we should take a step back from the politics of this and look at the broader picture. You know, we're all arguing about local control, about whether quality of life means low density or high density and so on. But this is political stuff. Not that it's not important, but it's about some people's values versus other people's values. But there's a broader picture that we should look at too. You forget about politics from whatever it is, man. You know, Sacramento, these folks have done a really poor job on housing. Okay? And housing is not an isolated case. The way I wrote the bullet in red at the top, you can read that as high-speed rail too. What we've got here, politics aside, is just basically poor work by Sacramento. They promised something aspirational, never looked seriously at what it would take to do it, spent a fortune, ended up with nothing, and now they want to close their eyes about it. Sacramento seems to have a really hard time solving problems lately. You know, look at energy. Sacramento supposedly regulates PG&E, yet continues to let them pass shareholder costs onto ratepayers, pay their CEO $52 million a year, and still not always keep the lights on. In our city, which former Mayor Koo was mayor of last year, right? You know, we have our own utility and our electricity costs are a third lower than PG&E's and they actually went down last year because we had a bumper year for hydro, okay? But at the same time, PG&E's are going up 20%. Where is Sacramento on this? They're supposed to be in charge of this. Whether it's housing, transportation, K-12 education, homelessness, property crime, budgeting, billions on COVID relief funds to crooks, and even people getting a real ID driver's license, for heaven's sake, underachievement seems to become the accepted norm in Sacramento. And if they can't even do these things, then how are they going to stop California from turning into a state for the very rich and the very poor while the middle class leaves for elsewhere? Somehow, we have to get better job performance out of the state legislature. Here in California, we have the highest state income tax in the nation. We ought to have the, base state, we ought to have the best state government in the nation, too. And very few would argue that we have that. So how do we get better work from Sacramento, not just on housing, but on everything? Okay, so a couple, just a couple footnotes here. Uh, first of all, 
you know, you know, your whole plan is losing any connection to reality, even if ever had any, when it's advocates have to start advocating and arguing that in order to achieve housing affordability, we actually need higher rents, not lower. And second, and maybe a little more practical, you know, somebody really ought to be calling the state's bluff here. The fact is it's been seven years, 150 laws, a couple of billion dollars, and there's basically nothing to show for it but higher prices and more homelessness. The legislature and HCD have so far got away with some very poor work and even some outright chicanery, and nobody's held them accountable for it. So when do Californians get what we've been promised? Now, obviously no legislature, no legislator wants to be asked this question. Most legislators want to talk about values and principles, not about accountability. But they've been steadfastly insisting more or less on faith that the whole obstacle is local control. And yet they've had seven years, 150 new laws, and a few billion dollars to prove that, and they haven't even come close. So revisiting some of those faith-based assumptions is a conversation that would be timely. The fact is, they don't have an answer to the when question, but that doesn't mean it's not important to ask. If anything, it makes it more important to ask. Given what it's costing Californians to have and how much farther they're planning to go, Californians deserve both an answer to the when question and also the discussion that it ought to prompt. You'd hope that the media and housing advocacies would be asking this, but so far most of them haven't. So in addition to our other efforts, I wanna propose we consider asking the when question too, because somebody needs to, and actually everybody needs to. Okay. And that is the end. And uh, open for discussion, comments.